Hi everyone, welcome back. This is video number three, how to figure out your own life plan using life insurance. Steps that I help walk my clients uh, go through to help realize how much life insurance they should buy and which plan to buy. If you haven't watched video number one and video number two from previous weeks, I would suggest you to go to them first. Video number one cover what is life insurances, common responses I get about the topic, topic, and how you can leverage it in your estate plan. Video number two dives into the three main types of life insurance in the market. I went through the pros and cons, comparison with the plans, and how you can leverage them to your estate planning. My name is Catherine Lee, and I've been an insurance broker for the past 12 years. The goal of my channel is to help empower you with the knowledge about insurance so that you can protect what matters most to you. Here are the steps I walk my clients through. Number one, what is the ideal coverage? Sometimes there's a magical number that everyone has in their mind of how much they want to be covered. There is no right or wrong answers. No one is judging. You could be thinking of $100,000 is enough, but someone else could be thinking $10 million is enough. Everyone's circumstances are different and thoughts are not all the same. Most people have no idea and that's okay too. If It's not an easy topic to discuss. Um, I help my client by asking personal questions to help determine this number. Here are some exercises that an insurance broker or agent should walk their client through. Typically, this process is called fact finding, which is collecting the client's information. Questions like, what is your current income, your spouse's, how much debt is outstanding today? What are your goals and plans for the future? For example, like how many children do you plan to have or, or currently have? How many savings do you have? So sometimes I usually have to tell my clients, please trust us in this process because collecting this information help us understand your financial situation better before we can provide any advice. If I don't have my clients trust, then they'll prov provide me bogus numbers and it just doesn't make sense. A lot of prospects tries to dodge the current income question. I often remind them by saying, look, if you're making $50,000, you don't want us to propose to you to put $20,000 premium away for life insurance. In order to give you proper advice, we need to understand your financial situation. Once the information is collected, advisors are supposed to do a needs analysis. We will provide you a summary of what we think you should be covered based on the information collected. Typically, you should be covered at least two to three times of your salary. And here are the reasons why. Funeral and bureau costs. Emergency funds that could have been wiped out during a medical leave or loss of income during illnesses. Most people don't know that they could be sick for years before the big D-Day. We found that families tend to grieve for at least two years before they could say they are recovering. During these hard times, they may need financial support because one income may not be enough. There's a lot of adjustment for the family. Without your future income, the family may need to downsize and make changes to, to have an affordable lifestyle without you in the picture. Those are the perspectives. Now, the next question I tend to ask my client is, what is your budget? Look, a prospect can come in and say, I want a million dollar coverage for $10 a month. Make it happen. I would tell that prospect that I want the same deal. They can share with me what they can when they can find that unicorn plan. If you've seen video number two with the different types of life insurances, you would know that there are different prices for different products. If a client tells me that their budget for life insurance, I get to like, I get to understand their hard stop on the budget, which helps me understand which plans to propose to them. There are a lot of life insurance companies out there. If I had to send every proposal with every little option and no idea what they want in coverage or budget, it just becomes very overwhelming and it doesn't help narrow down the options. You should know that as a client, there is a revision in a proposal. 
I tend to submit multiple proposals when my clients come to a realization of what they truly want and sometimes they make an adjustment to their budget after they've been educated on the types of insurances and what kind of strategies could work for them, then they would actually ask for a revision. So we walk through step number one. What do you want for coverage? Provide the financial information to help determine that number. Step number two, what is your budget? That helps provide me the ceiling of what you want to pay. I can then set the proposal within your limits and expectations. Step number three, which is the revision of the proposal. Clients start to engage the conversation, ask questions, get a better understanding of the product and the different plans. So during this phase, you learn what would work for you which leads to step number four, signing up for the plan. Here's something that most clients or prospects don't know. You may have inquired about the life insurance quotes, but it does not mean you will get the life policy. A life insurance contract can only be established between the client and the insurance carrier by going through a life application process. Sometimes this application goes through underwriting, which is a hired professional to evaluate and assess the medical findings on the client to see if this is a good business contract. There's plenty of insurance contracts and companies out there. Each one of them has different set of rules and coverages. So I usually go through step number five, which is the health assessment. I ask my client and their client and their parents or siblings, have they ever been sick, list all the major illnesses and diseases they had. If a client had cancer, stroke, or heart attack, it is very hard to get life insurance. If their family already had it, then it could also affect their rates, which is why I ask personal questions and try to help my clients understand how they can get rated based on their current health or family health history. Here are tips to applying for life insurance. Um, Always get underwriting upfront, not post underwriting, which is at the time of death. Underwriting means that it's going to be assessed and checked at the time for when you're applying for life insurance today. Depending on the coverage, your application, your life application must have all the proper disclosure to show that you have been honest about your health. They may request blood and urine work to prove it. They could also request an attending physician statement, which is signed by off, signed off by your family doctor, confirming you don't have the list of illnesses. The onus will be put on the family doctor to sign off about your health records. This is best done upfront because underwriting should come back and say, look, based on your blood test results, you have hep B and we have, we may need to rate you 50% higher than quoted. Would you accept the contract? So surprisingly at the application period, you, we get to understand you better health wise. Another tip, do not drink alcohol, smoke, or get high and eat lots of fatty foods before a blood test or a urine test. If you want to keep your life insurance premiums low and maintainable, it's best to make better life decisions and get better results so that the life underwriter doesn't penalize you with higher premiums. Now, number th- another tip would also be to consider as a non-smoker, you can't smoke at least 12 months so that your urine test can't detect it. Now, I've heard questions followed up about that, which is, what if I quit smoking for 12 months, get my life insurance, and then I can smoke right after? This goes to the next clause that I warn my clients, which is be careful to the suicide clause. This is practically on all contracts. For Ontario, typically it's the first 24 months of the policy. If the client made any decisions that led to premature death, there's no payout in the life policy. So to follow up with the same client, if you purposely got a non-smoker rate by quitting for 12 months and then waited to get life insurance, then you start smoking again. Then less than a year later, say the client passed away due to lung cancer, the doctor can confirm with the test that you know the client had been smoking up to their death and that that was the cause of death. What do you think would happen? Well, claim is declined. Let's just say the client didn't die due to lung cancer, but a motor vehicle accident. If the, if the life insurance company can prove that the client sped on the road before the crash and passes away, then the claim could also be denied. Which is why I recommend to my clients who plans to quit smoking, please quit at least three years. Drive safely and do everything safely. Do not try to pass away in the first 24 months where they can prove that the decision led to premature death. That is 
the definition of suicide clause, which has allowed them, the insurance company, to decline, to decline the claim. Do not engage in high-risk activities like jumping off a plane. It doesn't matter if you have a parachute, swimming with the sharks in the deep sea, or car racing. Again, the first 24 months of any contract, there is a suicide clause. Any decision made by you that led to premature death, no payout of life insurance. The insurance company may give your family a return of premium, but would it really help your family? So don't engage these high-risk activities. When applying for life insurance, please be honest about your health. Provide as many details as possible. I actually make my clients um, do some research. If I hear a response like, I don't remember the doctor's name. My follow-up response would be, can you reach out to your family doctor and get that information? They normally list it in your files. Tell them that you're applying for life insurance. Most often, they would help. There's no such thing as relevant information. You could have had an asthma at a very young age for a short period or a back pain years ago. Share these information and make sure it's listed in your file. Let the underwriter decide what is relevant and what is not. Disclose everything to the best of your knowledge. You don't want to be listed as misrepresentation or fraud um, where your contract can be voided because you couldn't remember your health history. Now, step number six, get your will updated. After you've been acqui- if, after you've acquired the life insurance contract and proceed to keep it, always make sure your will ha- has your life insurance policy information. That way, it's easier for your family to apply for the benefit. The final last step of the life insurance plan is to pay for it, which is step number seven. Do not miss a payment. Insurance can be canceled due to non-payment. Once you've created the plan, please make sure you keep up with your commitment. Once you're done paying, you can go out and celebrate. Actually, in fact, I need to add step number eight. Review, revise, and make changes. As time goes on, your perspective may change. I find clients who are getting older finds the importance of life insurance grows with them. They buy more because they realize how much taxes their children are going to pay if they wanted their inheritance. It's never too late. In fact, most people who have bought life insurance carry at least three different life policies in their lifetime. You don't have to fully commit your life plan at the earliest stage of your life. You can buy more as you make more money. In my experience, I could go through a needs analysis and tell a client, hey, they need $500,000 life coverage, but the client could come back and say, I only want $100,000 and I really only want to pay $200 a month. Sometimes clients have a hard stop on their budget and they just don't feel comfortable to commit to the next 20 years or more based on their comfort zone. Everyone's comfort zone is different, like buying a car or a home. Do we own all the same types of cars and homes? No, everyone has their own style and flair to it. Sometimes for another prospect with the same needs of half a million dollar coverage, they can respond and say, no, I really just want to buy $1 million coverage because I'm willing to pay $10,000 a year. These are normal responses when it comes to life insurance. So find someone you can vibe with, someone you're willing to share your personal information with, and the best advice is come to, comes to you because you were honest about your situation. To reveal these steps, okay? Step number one, what is your ideal coverage? Step number two, what is your budget? Step number three, revision of your proposal is quite common. Step number four, signing up for the plan. Step number five, which is the health assessment. Always do underwriting up front rather than post underwriting, which because you wouldn't be around at the time of death to prove your innocence. The only thing that's left is the original application on your life policy. Make sure you are honest to the best of your knowledge. Step number six, update your will and have your life insurance information mentioned in it so that your family have an idea where to apply for the death benefit when the time comes. Step number seven is keep up with the payment. No payment could also mean the end of your life insurance. 
Step number eight is review, revise, and make necessary changes. I hope this could help you get started with your life plan. Make sure, please make sure to subscribe and share in the comments below. Bye for now.